Good evening. Welcome to the final lecture in the St. John's Cleveland Lenten course on the Festal Icons. This lecture brings our journey to a conclusion. Having studied how icons are made and learned how to start to read their mysterious and profound messages, we now come to examine two of the most important icons in the iconographic canon. The Crucifixion. There are two basic forms of this archetype. The version on the left is a Greek icon, whilst the one on the right, distinguished by the angled foot bar, is Russian. The angled foot bar is a defining characteristic of the so-called Russian cross. It is found throughout Russian Orthodoxy on church buildings, furnishings, liturgical blessing crosses, and as crucifixes. The origin of the angled footrest comes from the fact that the thief on Christ's right repented and went figuratively upwards to paradise, whilst the thief on the left went the other way. So the footrest dramatically represents man's two possible responses to what God has done for us on the cross. Other features of interest are the blood-stained earth is cloven in two by the cross. Below is Adam's skull in Hades. Adam, meaning all of mankind, all who died before the crucifixion of our Lord. Orthodox tradition tells us that Christ's cross and Adam's tree stood in the same place. St John Christosom, in his homily on the burial place and the cross, says, a virgin, a tree, and a death were the symbols of our defeat. The virgin was Eve, the tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the death was Adam's penalty. But behold, again, a virgin, and a tree, and a death. Those symbols of defeat become the symbols of his victory. Christus Victor. The poet, John Donne, in his Hymn to God, My God in My Sickness, writes, We think that Paradise and Calvary, Christ's cross and Adam's tree, stood in one place. The four letters on the footrest, MLRB, and the four letters on the stipes just above the mountain, GGGA, are stylized abbreviations for the place of the skull becomes paradise and to the hill of Golgotha, the head of Adam. Jesus is shown naked. Even after extreme torture and a humiliating death, human sensibilities dictate that we hide our embarrassment by giving him a loincloth, albeit blue, to show that it is the divine private parts that are hidden. The art world had to wait until 1492 for Michelangelo, who else, to be honest enough to show the crucifixion scene as described in the Gospels. The most striking detail here is that Jesus is shown dead and yet he still has a halo. Despite undergoing bodily death, Jesus' divinity has not left him. Even bleeding and physically dead upon the cross, Christ is still fully divine. He wears a crown of glory, not a crown of thorns. His hands are shown palm upwards, almost in an embrace. As the Akathist hymn, to the passion of Christ says, Jesus who stretches out your hands from the cross to all, draw me to yourself, for I too have gone astray. Unlike images shown in Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ, or some Western statues, icons of the crucifixion tend not to dwell on the extreme physical details of the passion, but following the example of Saint Pope Saint Leo the Great, attempt to convey the meaning of the crucifixion. 
at Christ being lifted up on the cross, let the eyes of your mind not dwell only on that sight which those naked sinners saw, but let our understandings foster with pure and free heart the glory of the cross which irradiates heaven and earth. This icon is inscribed with mystical writings in Old Church Slavonic text. At the top of the cross is the familiar INRI, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. On either side of the patibulum, the crossbar, IX and XC for Jesus Christ. On the upper part of the patibulum, it reads, the crucifixion of the Lord, the King of glory, the Son of God. Despite the sorrow and anguish we feel at seeing our Lord dead on the cross, described by Pope Benedict as a cosmic event, when all creation shuddered, the hope of the Christian is declared in the lower text on the patibulum, we venerate your cross, Lord, and glorify your holy resurrection. That hope is further shown by the icon within the icon at the top, the mandilion, the face not painted by human hands, with its text, N-I-K-A, for victory, and on the triform halo, the existing one, or he who is. <clears throat> Supreme ruler and Lord of heaven and earth, seeing thee, the immortal king, hanging on the cross, all creation was changed. Heaven was horrified and the foundations of the earth were shaken. But we, unworthy as we are, offer thee thankful adoration for thy passion on our behalf. And with the robber we cry to thee, Jesus, son of God, remember us when thou comest in thy kingdom. Unlike those experiencing the passion of our Lord as it happened nearly 2000 years ago, we know that it didn't end with his death and burial. In Bach's St. John Passion, the choir conclude by singing, ah, Lord, when my last end is come, Bid angels bear my, bear, bear my spirit home to Adam's bosom going. My flesh laid in the quiet tomb shall sleep until the day of doom, nor pain nor sorrow knowing. Then waking from that dark abode, mine eyes shall see thee face to face in boundless joy, O Son of God, my Saviour and my throne of grace. Lord Jesus Christ, give ear to me, give ear to me, who sing an ending praise to thee. These words of hope are equally illustrated in this, the icon par excellence, the resurrection or the anastasis, otherwise known as the harrowing of Hades. This does not just so Christ risen from the dread, dead or an empty tomb, but rather the complete victory over death. As the Orthodox sing at Matins on Easter Day, Christ is risen from the dead. By death hath he trampled down death, and on those in the graves hath he bestowed life. In English, there is often confusion with the terms hell and Hades. Hades refers to the resting place of the dead. Hell is generally defined as the eternal fate of the unrepentant sinners, those who have deliberately, purposefully, and willfully cut themselves off from the love of God. This helps us to understand the apparent paradox in the Apostles' Creed, he, Jesus, descended into hell. If Jesus is God, how by going into hell can he be cut off from himself? To do so, he would no longer be God. It would be more accurate to say that he descended into Hades. That is what is shown in this icon. Harrowing is derived from the old English verb to harry, a military term meaning to attack, assail, assault, charge or rush. 
Jesus Christ, not content with laying in the tomb for three days after the crucifixion, attacked Hades to fight for and free the souls trapped there. The doors of Hades are broken open. In some depictions, they are shown in the form of a cross, because through the victory of the cross, death was defeated. Jesus is shown here in his victorious, radiant, transfigured and resurrected glory, dressed in heavenly white robes, billowing behind him as he descends into Hades. He is surrounded by a mandola, the star-studded radiant light which appears to shine with such glory that it completes the golden background. The glory of the resurrected Jesus is such that the created order is diminished. Look how the mountains appear almost translucent in his presence. The mountains bow backwards in acknowledgement or homage to the resurrected Jesus. Jesus is depicted wrenching Adam and Eve from their tombs. Note he is grabbing them by the wrist, not shaking them by the hand. Where he touches them, their clothing becomes blue, the divine colour, as if to emphasise that he is really a divine action taking place. Eve's hand is hidden, left, in Latin, sinister. It is speculated that this represents the hand that plucked the apple from the tree at the fall. Some depictions of these archetypes show, in addition to Adam and Eve, the patriarchs, prophets, apostles and martyrs. However, I asked Aidan Hart to paint this icon with just Adam and Eve, because they fittingly represent all of humanity touched and rescued by Jesus in his harrowing of Hades. The darkness of Hades has a twofold meaning. First, to show the coldness of death, but second, as we've seen repeated in all of these icons, it announces a great creative event. What could be more creative than the defeat of death by the risen Christ? Within Hades are shown various representations of the instruments of torture used in the underworld to torment its previous occupants. There is also a pathetic creature bound in chains, turning away from Jesus. Some say that this is a personification of death defeated. Others, that this is a soul which, even in the presence of the risen Christ, turns away from God and is condemned to hell. The Paschal Kentuckian appropriately sums up this icon. Thou didst descend into the tomb, O immortal. Thou didst destroy the power of death. In victory didst thou arise, O Christ God, bestowing a resurrection to the fallen. That concludes our six-week journey examining the festal icons that you have housed here at St John's Clevedon. For those who wish to learn more about this fascinating subject, I would recommend the following books. Icons and Saints of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Also, two superb and easily readable books by Lord Williams of Oystermouth, Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury. The first is Ponder These Things. This book is based upon a series of talks Rowan gave when he was Bishop of Monmouth and led his diocesan pilgrimage to Walsingham. It examines three of the most famous Marian iconographic archetypes and also describes the tale of Mary spinning the thread for the veil of the temple we heard about in the second lecture. The second book by Rowan is The Dwelling of Light, which describes the icons of the Transfiguration, the Resurrection, the Holy Trinity and the Pantocrata. Finally, literally hot off the press, which could not be more appropriate for the conclusion of this lecture series. My friend 
Aidan Hart has just published The Grace Wing, wait for it, Festal Icons. Thank you.